Good afternoon. This is Elizabeth Karcher. I'm the Executive Director at the Woodrow Wilson House, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our, uh, I guess this is our second series and our third episode of our Lunch and Learn at the Woodrow Wilson House. We do it on Zoom at noon on Tuesdays, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Garibaldi. I'll, I'm going to introduce him in a minute. Um, first, I wanted to give you an update on uh, the adventures and exciting things that are happening at the Woodrow Wilson House. We are thrilled that the Suffrage Outside exhibit opened last week. Uh, we had some rain the first week, but it has been beautiful and we have had really wonderful attendance outside in the garden. It is an all outdoors, all outside exhibit on suffrage. It is in the rear garden of the Woodrow Wilson House. Uh, we've sent out newsletters with some information and some links. It's been covered uh, uh, in the national news with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, as well as local news, which is really terrific. And I welcome you to come and see this uh, exhibition. It's, as again, it's called Suffrage Outside. It, you can get tickets for a timed slot. Uh, it is in the rear garden. If you have need assistance accessing stairs, please call us and we'll help you with the elevator in the house. But otherwise, you can access it through the garage and into the rear garden. We have some other exciting things that are happening at the Wilson House. We have our Wadi Butler Wood walking tour, which has uh, we launched this summer. And a number of people now that the weather again is beautiful, people are out and about walking through the neighborhood. We have also launched the Calorama walking tour, which is an audio walking tour. You can download that once again through our website and take a, a self-guided audio walking tour through the Calorama neighborhood. Uh, that goes around the Woodrow Wilson House. When you get to the Wilson House, you'll see our victory garden, which we planted when the pandemic started in uh, April. We thought, what can we do and keep ourselves busy? We researched on victory gardens and learned that they were something that Woodrow Wilson and his administration pushed during World War I. They have taken off. They are now called Victory Gardens, War Gardens, and now Kitchen Gardens. Our kitchen garden is beautiful. Bring your scissors, snip some of our herbs. Uh, it is, um, it's something to learn about the history of Victory Gardens uh, and Columbia, which is the image that you use that we see for uh, Victory Gardens and sowing the seeds of victory. And in fact, was the inspiration for our Suffrage Outside exhibit in the rear garden. Um, in addition, we have the, to the speaker series, we have uh, a lineup for the rest of September and October, and now through November. So we welcome you to uh, tune in and, and listen to our speaker series. Very simple, one hour lunch and learn about topics that somehow tie to Woodrow Wilson or the Woodrow Wilson House. So with that, I would like to get started on today's talk. We have uh, Professor Garibaldi, Corey Garibaldi. He is um, studies, he's uh, research interests are 20th century United States history, modern transnational history, especially between the US and Europe, history and the book of 20th century American literary history. He's the assistant professor in the Department of American Studies at Notre Dame. And I will say it was one of our summer scholars who helped introduce us to uh, Professor Garibaldi. She's a student at Notre Dame and made the introduction. Garibaldi studies the social and intellectual history of the United States with a special interest in the history of late 19th and 20th century literary production. His courses focus on modern histories of citizenship transnationalism, cultural and economic thought, and the African diaspora. He is currently finishing the manuscript for a book tentatively titled Dreams of Democracy. The study explores, explores the intermittent flourishing of cross-racial industrial print culture in the United States underpinning the genre now commonly celebrated as African American literature. It shows how innumerable literary, professional, and technological challenges to the color line now taken for granted were once central to the promotion of cosmopolitan habits and mentalities during the Jim Crow era. 
Prior to joining the College of Arts and Letters faculty, Garibaldi was a joint residential fellow at the University of Chicago's Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. With that, I would like to welcome Professor Garibaldi. Today's talk is Woodrow Wilson and the, Fe and the Fence, Race, Architecture, and Democracy at Princeton. So welcome, Professor. Thank you very so, much. Welcome. You've just come from class, Thanks which is exciting. And uh, we're very happy to have you join us now for today's session. Thank you. So um, my apologies if I'm a little, a little bit out of breath, but uh, I think I can get back up to speed here. So uh, we're going to talk today about uh, this uh, project that I'm working on. This is something that's a little bit of a work in progress. So uh, any and all feedback is more than welcome on the talk that I'm going to give to you today. Uh, these are... Uh, histories of race architecture and race and architecture at Princeton. So I uh, was looking at the Oswald Garrison Villard uh, archive uh, manuscript collection at uh, Harvard University in 2016. And I was primarily working on my first book, which is a study of 20th century interracial literary culture. When I was in that archive, I was looking at Villard's papers. Villard was a, a white uh, board member of the NAACP. He was one of the founding board members. He uh, most famously was a journalist. His family had been in, uh, in, in the literary business for generations in the U.S. And I came across this correspondence that he had with uh, Woodrow Wilson. And I think that this is actually on the, the first slide here. There's not that much surprising about this particular uh, story or this exchange. Uh, this is a letter where Villard is, Villard is basically writing to Woodrow Wilson, and Wilson is asking for his uh, federal, um, his, his endorsement and the endorsement of the NAACP for his president, uh, presidential campaign. So this is in 1912. And there's a deep suspicion uh, on behalf of the African Americans who Villard is working with and the white interlocutors who are involved in the NAACP, they, they're not certain that Wilson is someone who they can endorse without him disavowing uh, any uh, plans to segregate the federal government or any plans to exclude uh, African Americans from federal office. So I'll just read from the bottom paragraph of this document. Uh, so far as uh, your proposed statement is concerned, this is Villard writing to Wilson, uh, I feel very strongly that nothing important can be accomplished among the colored people until we have an utterance from you, which we can quote, they not unnaturally mistrust you because they have been told that Princeton University closed its doors to the colored man in parentheses and was about the only Northern institution to do so uh, during your presidency. They know that uh, besides yourself, uh, both McAdoo and McComb are, are, are of Southern birth. Uh, so effectively what's happening here is that he's saying, we know about your, your legacy with racism. We know that you've excluded uh, black students from Princeton University. And we're, we know that you're exceptional in doing so. So that I'd heard this general narrative about Wilson segregating the federal government. That, of course, was not something that was either new or unusual for me. I vaguely knew that African-American students uh, did not have a good track record of attending Princeton University, but I didn't know that Princeton University was an exceptional institution in implementing a racially exclusive policy at, at its school. And so I'm looking at this in 2016. It's around the time of the last presidential administration. And I keep sort of digging around and looking at some other stuff on Woodrow Wilson. And I come across this curious uh, article on uh, the fence, Woodrow Wilson and the fence, which was written in 1956. It was published in the uh, Princeton Alumni Weekly. Uh, during his presidency at Princeton in 1904, uh, well, his presidency starts in 1902, and I think it officially ends in 1910. During uh, the, the second year, the second or third year of his presidency, Woodrow Wilson orders 
a tall iron fence built around the official president's home uh, at Princeton University. So this is a very large fence. The fence is enclosing about five acres of land around the president's mansion. It, uh, to give you a sense of what this is, this is about 21,000 acres, a little bit over 21,000, I'm not, I'm sorry, a little bit over 21,000 feet of land. Uh, in football terms, this is, you know, I, I teach at a football school, it's about four and a half uh, football fields. Uh, it was land that was used by the public for picnicking. It was land that we, was used by the students. Uh, long story short, it was deeply, deeply, deeply unsettling to uh, the students and other folks who were associated with the Princeton community at this time to have this tall iron fence of about, uh, I think it's about 10 feet high, erected around his home. So what was curious to me is that people were writing about a fence over 50 years later. Uh, despite it being just a, you know, what I would otherwise assume would be a small fence around a home, because this was happening around the time of the last presidential election in 2016, uh, I thought that it was curious in terms of what it had in common with rhetoric about walls, uh, certainly about the wall on the southern border, and was made me think about continuities, some parallels between uh, Woodrow Wilson and our current president that would have never uh, struck me otherwise, especially given the ways that we think about Woodrow Wilson as being, you know, an enlightened, educated person. Some of, uh, you know, recent people who've defended his legacy have referred to Wilson as a quote unquote genteel racist. So all sorts of things that made me sort of look at parallels or intersections with Woodrow Wilson and with Donald Trump that I'd never thought about before. I want to be cautious. I'm not saying that Woodrow Wilson is Donald Trump or anything like Donald Trump in particular, but there are some parallels that uh, I find visually fascinating that I think are worth uh, investigating in our talk today. To just give you one example, uh, that's the second piece of uh, second piece on the slide. The the person who uh, wrote in another another alum in 1956 writes in. And he's yet another person who's basically denouncing Wilson as someone who's not democratic. So that one of the things that happens after Wilson leaves Princeton University is that there's a whole sort of aura and rhetoric around him where he's very closely associated with uh, international uh, friendship, uh, democratic principles, and just being someone, of course, obviously the new freedom is one that's very important. Uh, his detractors would often invoke this fence, and then they would often invoke it to describe him as someone who was not that democratic at all. May I have the next slide? So this is a, an image of Princeton University's campus in 1952. Uh, if you look at the, the center of campus, uh, there's, there aren't that many buildings. If you look to the left, there's a kind of uh, an image where you can see a border, you see a circle, you see a border, and it's, it's in the, uh, it's, let's see, right on the east of Washington Road prospect. If you look one building in, you kind of see this like fortress around, around the, yes, exactly, where the mouse is. This is, this is the fence, <laughs> the contentious fence that Wilson built around the house. So you can kind of have a sense of just how big it was uh, it was effectively something in 1952, there may have been ways that you could walk in and out of it, but uh, certainly when it was built and during his presidency, that is actually not something that you could, could, you could do. I'm not sure what the architecture of the co college was like in 1952, but I think that it was actually the, the barrier around it and, the, and especially people having to go around uh, that really infuriated the undergraduates in particular that uh, he had built it. The, May I have the next slide, please? The thing that fascinated me when I started look into, looking into the story is that there are all sorts of parallels with that fence that you could see rendered in visual iconography that was discussing and critiquing Wilson's international policies. So this particular image was done sometime between 1913 and 1917. It is a fictive image of or Wilson at, on, at a fictive border between the US and Mexico. Wilson is on the left. Uh, you have Taft uh, beckoning to Wilson uh, right in front. And then you have uh, a, a, a 
pretty racist caricature of a, a Mexican bandit on the, the south side of the border. And then on the, the background, you have Uncle Sam. So that one thing uh, that people should know about Wilson's policy, international policy, policies in the 1910s is that he, he kind of has this uh, paradoxical, uh, paradoxical position in that he's declaring that America is not going to have, uh, not going to side with any, either of the parties in World War I. We are supposed to be a neutral party. Uh, this is the president who popularizes the slogan, America first. So he first utters this statement or invokes this slogan in a widely publicized purported affirmation of the nation's neutrality towards the beginning of world, uh, the First World War in 1915. I'm quoting from Woodrow Wilson here, quote, I'm not speaking in a selfish spirit when I say that our whole duty for the president at any rate is summed up in this motto, America first, exclamation mark, unquote. So that even as we are declaring neutrality in the war, obviously we will enter the, enter the war a couple of years later, one of the things that's happening at the border is that we're having an increasingly belligerent policy with Mexico at this time. Uh, this has been described, uh, characterized by other historians talking about figures from this uh, period as, or periods preceding this as America's big stick diplomacy. So that you see not only sort of how there's a differing perception in terms of, I think I would call this a white supremacist image, but then also how, the, uh, how this figures in with how the image of uh, a Mexican is rendered right at the other side of the border. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? So this is an example of where uh, African-American commentators pick up on this. So that there's a sense that Woodrow Wilson is being belligerent at the border and that he is imposing and threatening in Mexico's uh, political sovereignty at the same time that you still have, of course, racial violence in the South. And what Du Bois is actually pointing out and critiquing, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois here, as Wilson ignoring that racial violence. So that there's this dynamic whereby Wilson is willing to respond aggressively in the case of Mexico. This is something that Villard and numerous others critique Wilson for, uh, but that persons like Du Bois are putting together with stories of him not intervening elsewhere. May I have the next image, please? This is uh, ironically and unfortunately the image where W.E.B. Du Bois endorses Wilson for president in 1912. This is the same year that uh, Villard and the same month actually that Villard and Wilson are corresponding about the African-American endorsement. And so one of the things that Du Bois is saying in this endorsement of the president is, you know, he's a little bit nervous about Wilson. He says, you know, Wilson is, um, let me see, let me see if I can find this right here. Uh, Wilson, there's some disquieting facts about Wilson. He was born in Virginia and he was long president of a college which did not admit Negro students and yet was not honest enough to say so. So that it's effectively the same words that Villard is using in his personal correspondence with Wilson. Uh, less than a year later, Wilson is going to go ahead and segregate the federal government. So that this is in many ways going to be one of the hugest things uh, on, uh, you know, African Americans uh, list of protests when it comes to Woodrow Wilson. But one of the things that I find really fascinating is that even as Du Bois never forgets that Wilson has segregated the government, he's as if not more infuriated by the, pack, by the fact that Woodrow Wilson is excluding African-American students. So uh, to give you a sense of just how conspicuous that would be for someone like Du Bois, he's the first African-American to uh, receive a PhD from Harvard, not its first graduate. And he received his degree in 1895 and, and Harvard would have still been actively uh, admitting African-Americans during this time that he's making pleas and trying to inquire about on whether or not they're actually going to admit African-Americans. They, they don't have their first African-American graduate until 1948, I think, maybe 1947. May I have the next slide, please? One of the things that people knew about Princeton University that was supposed to be exceptional, that was supposed to make it an outlier from its peers is that 
this was supposed to be the a, a southern university. This is this is how uh, people like Du Bois characterized it. Paul Robeson, who's from Princeton, called it the uh, northernmost town in the south. This image is an image of Pros Prospect House, the home that we looked at on the map of Princeton University. So this is a, the the first uh, Prospect House. It uh, was. Uh, torn down, and there's another structure that was built there in 1853. This is to give you a sense of what it was like in the late 18th century. It was uh, pretty well integrated within uh, the Princeton campus. It was adjacent to it. It wasn't yet on Princeton University's property. Students used to go and uh, have like, you know, like some of the vegetation that was grown on the land. The land barrier that separated the home from uh, the rest of the area outside uh, was very small. Uh, the owners had a, a pretty good relationship with uh, the students so that they sort of thought of this as like a, a, um, a, a place that they admired and had uh, positive relationships uh, rather than ones that uh, were in any way antagonistic, which is often the case in university communities. May I have the next slide? The home that went up, the next prospect house is an Italianate ma mansion it was built in, I think it was built in the early 1850s. So the family who purchased Prospect House or who purchased the farm and the, uh, and the dwelling that sat on Prospect House, they were uh, large sl uh, slave holders and they, were, they owned multiple rice plantations in the South. They actually were Southern. They, uh, when they built, right before they built Prospect House, they relocated to um, Princeton but their wealth, the family's wealth actually came from plantation uh, agriculture and through owning and selling, selling slaves. And so this is the history of the house. It's still something that was held as private property. Uh, when the uh, man and wife died who owned it, it was their children attended Princeton and they, are, they, they also assumed property in Princeton, including, in, including this home. May I have the next slide? This is Thomas Sully, or this is Thomas Sully's images of the two owners. It's John Potter and Catherine Fuller. May I have the next slide? This is Prospect House today. So it's, now I think it's actually the faculty club for Princeton University. Uh, but you can get a sense of its largesse, Obviously, this is just the front image. Uh, it is a, it's a dwelling that, uh, at least from my knowledge and from, from seeing it personally, is, it's very, very big. One of the things that is kind of curious about this, uh, the history of the family, of the Wilson family being in this house is that, at least initially, they really, really, really didn't like living in the house. Wilson's wife, Ellen Wilson in particular, was uh, deeply unhappy here. And, and at some point, there's this vignette of, um, one of his biographers describes where Wilson walks in on his wife crying and he says, uh, I never should have brought you here. Uh, <laughs> this in a very curious way uh, gives you a sense of a, a, a more somber portrait of uh, Wilson at Prospect House with his family. So he's this, in this photo, he's uh, there with his wife and with his daughters. This was taken around 1910, which would have been one of his last years at the, um, as at the, at the house. May I have the next slide, please? So the house, the, the fence that here wrecks around Prospect House, this huge fence, it's not the only uh, fence or architectural development that happens this year. So that there's a ton of building going on when Prince, when Woodrow Wilson becomes president of Princeton, he, uh, he boasts to alumni uh, let me give you a quote from Princeton. He says, by the very simple device of building our new buildings in the Tudor Gothic style, we seem to have added to Princeton the age of Oxford and Cambridge. We have added a thousand years to the history of Princeton by merely putting those lines in our buildings, unquote. So that he's very aware of what he's doing when he's undergoing, uh, when he's you know, directing these architectural projects he actually says like this is something that he should have uh, absolute power over and he actually does so that the same year that he's building 
the fence around his house. He also orders the construction of the uh, Van Winkle gate, uh, not actually the Fitz Randolph uh, gate that's at the, at the border of campus. It's a very, very long, very imposing gate. Uh, so this is just like one of the design elements that he's implementing. He do, he's doing this about a couple years after other institutions are doing it as well. So Princeton isn't uh, necessarily novel for American universities for adding these kinds of features, but it's something that's happening uh, at the same time. The students don't really have any trouble with the iron fence that goes up in front of the university, but they're going to be very, very, very hostile to uh, what's happening with the fence going up around his home. Let me give you a sense of how some contemporaries perceived what was happening inside these gates. So this is from uh, a 1910 account published by Macmillan written by Edwin Emery Slauson. And he's describing the composition of Princeton's student body. One of the things he's saying, uh, he's not targeting or talking about African-American students, but he's talking about Jewish students when he opens up this vignette. Uh, I quote, anti-Semitic feelings seemed to me more dominant at Princeton than in any other universities I'd visited. If the Jews uh, once got in, I was told, this is a quote that he takes from a Princeton student they would ruin Princeton as they, have ru if they, as they have Columbia and the University of Pennsylvania, unquote. So that there's a sense that Princeton is standing apart. And one of the things that's complementing the ways that Princeton has stand, is standing apart under Wilson's tenure of the of school is uh, through erecting these gates. The students uh, react very, very hostily to Wilson's fence. This was really fascinating to me. I think it would be a little bit of a stretch to say that they're reacting politically. Uh, some of them, I think, uh, certainly like the accounts you have that were published in the 1950s. Uh, there are accounts by uh, Norman Thomas, who becomes a famous social activist, a famous interracial activist. After this time, he starts to associate the fence as a symbol of uh, Wilson's racial prejudice. The stu there are some hints that the students also associate uh, the fence with not only sort of what they describe and characterize as his autocratic dictator dictatorial rule of Princeton, but that they also associated with uh, racial prejudice uh, and racial violence. Uh, and we'll get to some of that in a moment. Well, let me give you, um, let me give you a history of, of what happened. Effectively, what happens is that uh, they attacked the fence several times over the course of the fall semester when it went up. They uh, have alumni who attack the fence in the spring. The thing that is arguably one of the first sort of big acts of protest is that the uh, 10 of the seniors dress uh, up purportedly as the gate itself. Can I have a slide of this, please? And uh, they have all of these crazy signs that they're very funny, uh, drawbridge to the left, don't feed or annoy. They're carrying a pig that's supposed to represent Wilson. Uh, and these protests, these jokes, they coincide with like numerous uh, attacks on the fence itself so that they end up destroying portions of it. And one portion of the fence, of the, uh, one portion of the fence they have, uh, I think six, it's like put six feet underground. Uh, seniors who direct uh, freshmen to do this. Uh, the other action that they take during this time is that they destroy uh, 1879 Hall, which is a new residence hall that is adjacent to Prospect House. It was uh, just fe finished. Uh, and they basically sort of threw, gla they threw uh, rocks, threw glasses, they tore down chandeliers, they destroyed the steps. Wilson was infuriated by this. It, it was deeply upsetting to him that people would destroy this property. He wouldn't back down from having the fence taken down. Uh, one of the ways that he blew off steam actually after the attacks was uh, funnily enough flying to Palm Beach and, and staying there uh, for several months until uh, February of 1905. May I have the next slide? My hunch is that the students are trying to uh, model these costumes, not only after the fence, but seemingly from Ku, Ku Klux Klan's uh, robes that they would have been familiar with, uh, images and uh, symbols that would have been circulating widely uh, from at least 1870. 
May I have the next slide? So you can kind of see some of the visual, uh, visual parallels. I, um, I'm uncertain about this, but I would be surprised given what we know about Wilson and what the undergrads would have known. I mean, they would have known that they would have been at this particularly homogenous school, that this would have been something that would have not been strange for them to suggest. May I have the next slide? So this is an example of W.B. Du Bois. He's still talking about this in 1948. He's not gotten over it. Uh, you had your recent uh, African-American student who's graduated from the college, but he's sort of reiterating this point about Princeton University being like an unusually Southern school compared to its peers. Can I have the next slide? So one of the things that is an outcome of Princeton and, and his fences, he really is uh, upset and deeply offended by the fact that people are not happy with this fence, people, that people have been uh, working to destroy it. And so one of the things he does is he spends more time off campus. Uh, he also starts spending more time off campus away from alums who are in New England or who are on the Northeast who are more sympathetic to the students' concerns about the fence. And so one of the things that happens is that we know it's well documented by their uh, historians and other scholars that he uses a lot of like, darky jokes when he's going out uh, and pitching and marketing to uh, Princeton alums and he's trying to do fundraising. A lot of this rhetoric gets channeled into the kinds of political stuff that he gets involved in shortly thereafter. And so this is uh, a record from a Montgomery advertiser that's covering a speech that he's given, giving to uh, the Virginians, which is a group of people who are born and raised in Virginia who are effectively, you know, trying to actually find a way for the Democratic Party to come back into power uh, in DC. May I have the next slide? This is just a, uh, a sense of another sort of comment from uh, Oscar Micheaux, an African-American, criticizing Wilson's New Freedom. So this was published in his 1913 book. Uh, and what he's doing is it's uh, African-American men who are sitting in a restaurant. They're clearly dressed really well. Uh, their jo the jokes at the bottom basically say, you know, I'm going to have to go back to picking cotton uh, with uh, Wilson's new freedom, if this if this if this policy continues, so it's sort of you know a commentary on the ways that African Americans are being excluded from uh, various uh, positions and positions of power under the early years of the uh, Wilson presidency, the the pres presidency of the U.S. May I have the next slide? And I'm, I'm wrapping up pretty soon here. So. One of the many commentaries that comes out of Wilson showing uh, Birth of a Nation in the White House is Oscar Micheaux's Within Our Gates as another way of kind of thinking about the significance and the, the symbolism, the, the metaphor, uh, the metaphors that are invoked behind these kinds of barriers. And so this was a film that was uh, shot and released and available for uh, viewing in 1920. Next slide, please. And this is, uh, this is how the story ends. <laughs> the, the fence around Wilson's home is eventually torn down. It's torn down in 2013. So they uh, thought that, you know, time for change. One of the things that I find fascinating is that it's going to be the class of 1970 at Princeton who is going to be the class responsible for getting the university to open the Fitz Randolph gates. So one of the things I didn't realize is that not only is there this fence around the president's home, but that uh, the gates that people now uh, so regularly walk through when they are going between town and campus, uh, those gates were closed until the early 1970s. So uh, the image on the left is actually from the Fitz Rand Randolph gate and they're basically saying uh, together for unity so that this is actually connecting the community uh, back with Princeton University in ways that they had been shut out from it, at least through this entrance on campus for the past few decades. This is, this is my story. This is, this is, um, this is, this is, I'm going to cut there and if anyone has any comments, questions on this history, I'd love to hear them.
That's an amazing story. It's re and I like the parallels that you brought to it. So uh, the last image that you have on the Don't Fence Me In on campus, um, do you know, can you tell us a little bit what that statue is or the sculpture? I should say I'm sculpture. afraid I don't know the sculpture. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that I find interesting is that there's now the sculpture that they put up, um, Mr. Hood, the architect Hood, who put up, who designed and put up the uh, the sculpture in front of the Woodrow Wilson School, um, is what sparked the controversy. It was meant to be put up to start a conversation, and it sparked a lot of controversy. And that's what actually ultimately led to the changing of the name of the Woodrow Wilson School. At this, at, so it has a history. Uh, as yeah, a school of having these names and having sculptures and having designs that 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 are that cause tension and cause conflict uh, and, and then discussion and then of course change. So um, yeah, it was, I think it was a really it's hard to say because I, I didn't go to, I didn't go to Princeton, but I can't tell you how many records there are. I mean, there are people who are doing oral histories in the early '70s, literally, who are talking about that fence, talking about how they didn't want it there talking about him keeping it there. <laughs> and so it was, it was something, and I think it was, I mean, the weird thing about it is that it was really a conversation between insiders. And so I think you really had to sort of either be there or be near to know just how significant it was at the time, but it didn't get a lot of national coverage. It, it, was, it was covered in New York, but uh, I mean, all of the stuff that's ever been written about Prince, uh, written about Wilson that was cynical has been drowned out by positive coverage. I know that there are a number of people who are trying to get in. Um, so I'm, I can't wait to take people's questions. And Sure. So the first is, um, do those who build these fences and walls truly think that their goal of keeping, quote, the other out will be successful? Uh, I mean, it's a bit, it's a big question. In in Wilson's case, he you know, he really did keep people away from his house. One of the things that he says that he's doing is that he's keeping out, quote unquote, excursionists from Trenton. So that I think one of the things that students were, you know, students and certainly Wilson were upset by is people sort of being voyeurs on college campuses. I mean, you see this all the time now. Uh, I think that we have, we're much more at peace with it. Uh, this is a time where there's some hostility to it. There's some sense that some of the students are in agreement about sort of what it would mean to at least have some limited access to the campus. Mm -hmm. I think that they're much, much, much more upset when they feel as if the access has been limited for them. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't buy the line about excursions from Trenton. And the other thing that happens is that you have a number of later commentators who talk about, you know, this is an attempt to protect his daughters. You know, this is him being... Uh, a, a, a southern. Uh, this is a this is a reflection of his southern chivalry, and that means a, a something a lot different for African Americans when you think about the ways that racial violence is sort of uh, justified by uh, the protection of white womanhood in, in the vein that these people are commenting upon. So that uh, even the kind of rhetorical move of protecting his daughters. Uh, is something that is racially fraught and something that, you know, a number of the people who don't actually agree with the fence say, we don't buy it. Um, what do you personally feel the decision, uh, or how do you feel uh, personally about the decision to remove the Wilson name from the School of International Affairs? I, I'm open, um, as in, I don't, I don't have an opinion that I feel strongly enough about to say one way or the other. I think that people should be having these conversations. Uh, Princeton certainly changed its position. I think that it's alienating for African-American students to have an institution like that named after someone who, you know, worked to exclude them um, from the institution. I, I think that this is something that is a history that we just don't know enough about. So oftentimes when we talk about Princeton, or we, when, oftentimes when we talk about Woodrow Wilson and we talk about his legacy of racism, we talk about the segregation of the federal government, right? Uh, I think that there are fewer conversations about what happened at Princeton. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is the kind of area that needs further investigation that we definitely need to learn much, much, much more about. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if there's a deeper racial legacy tied to these fences that I'm not doing justice here. Mm 
-hmm. I think that we need to learn more about him. Um, I think that we need to learn more about a lot of these people who, you know, are responsible for policies that were so exclusionary. Uh, for me, the this instance of offense and this whole history of offense that I knew nothing about uh, really sort of illuminates like just like how much like work we need to do in order to understand uh, both like, our built environment and then also sort of how that intersects with legacies of racism in the past. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, fascinating juxtaposition of architecture and Wilson's views. Prospect House is the faculty club and outsiders can arrange to eat there. So that's just a, a side comment from Chris Keller. Um, Bonnie asks, what reason did Wilson give for building the fence? So one, so besides for the excursionist from Trenton comment, which is something that had been comment, which is something that I think had been something that multiple commentators had said about campus for years. He also said he was protecting his guard, uh, his wife's garden. <laughs> he said uh, there, there were, uh, he accused the students of uh, trampling on the garden and they, and then there was the protection of his daughters, which is something that uh, was regularly invoked. The fact of the matter is that Wilson really, really, really didn't want people at his house. <laughs> I mean, this was, a, uh, for those of, uh, those people who've studied Wilson and read about Wilson, uh, he was very, very isolated in this house. I'm calling it a house, it was a mansion. And he was isolated from the faculty in ways that he had not been isolated from the faculty before. He was isolated from his family in ways that he had not been isolated from his family before, which is something that I think sort of exacerbated his daughters and his wife being upset within the confines of the home. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it, was a, it was a kind of, uh, his, his sister-in-law later said, you know, this is Wilson's way of trying to conduct business. This is, universities are a big business. And he said, you know, he's basically said, you know, people need to recognize that uh, he's treating it as a big business. Uh, I mean, which is kind of ironic if you think about the kinds of conversations that we have around education today. So he really sort of built himself a mess. I mean, he, he built it so that he, you know, had this imposing you know, isolated structure, but uh, it, people both act, reacted really negatively and then it didn't necessarily make the people inside of the house any happier. Mm -hmm. um, just to point out the garden, it was actually the first garden uh, Ellen Wilson planted that. It was then when they moved to the White House, that was the original design that they used to do the Rose Garden in the White House. Oh, so wow. it was started by Ellen Wilson, of course, then she died. And so it was completed by Edith Wilson. I share that with you now because a hundred years later, they're now changing the Rose Garden. Um, but that Rose Garden was originally Ellen Wilson and it came from the design she had used and the garden, the garden architect, landscape architect uh, that she worked with at Prospect House. That was her inspiration for doing that at the White House. And you just and you've just done this lovely lovely exhibition that uh, connects to that as well. So. And we're connecting it to the garden, yes, uh, no, at the Wilson House. I think, I think from what I've read, I really think I think she had a hard time in that house. So the particulars of why she had a hard time in that house, I think, are ambiguous for me now. But she definitely didn't like it there. Uh, from what I've read and understand is that uh, her there was a, a tragic accident in of her family, um, actually a wagon accident, and it left her. Uh, brother and sister-in-law and some children um, died and that sent her into a very deep depression and um, she recognized that she was in a deep depression and but it, it did happen to coincide with living at this this particular time in her life. Um, the other piece that I wanted to mention is he lived on Library Place in Princeton before of course moving and as, as you said this house is really a manse it's a mansion um, and it's meant to be earning money for, for the making money at a university part of the entertaining and and um and bringing people to that to that particular uh putting putting princeton on the map it's interesting because when um this for the grandeur of this particular house on prospect house uh uh his house on library place when they f he designed that house and i'm just saying what i've read he designed the house and they didn't he didn't have enough money at the time when he designed the house on library place to have a back staircase um, and at the time you had a front staircase and a back staircase if you had enough money to have the two. And so he went from uh, the evolution of uh, living in a, they lived in a, 
uh, a rented place to being able to build their own, but not having enough money to put in a back staircase. And now, of course, to this um, beautiful uh, prospect house, which, of course, left, the, as you said, it was a time of uh, not, not e easy time for the Wilsons at that house. Um, you mentioned briefly the parallels between Wilson's rhetoric and the 2016 rhetoric around walls. What sort of weight did Wilson and or Princeton carry in the early 1910s that would have allowed the issue of the gate to enter the national conversation? Well, the fascinating, the fascinating thing of, uh, about people who are associated with this institution is that, I mean, this is one of the top Ivy Leagues, right? So that the, especially the donors in this era, there's going to be, Princeton's going to become a lot wealthier under uh, Woodrow Wilson, so that a lot of the architectural projects are made possible by people from his class at Princeton, the class of 1879, donating to the institution, so that it's going to be the two leading donors who donate Prospect House and, he, and, and make it so that Wilson becomes the second president of Princeton to live in it. A lot of these alumni are in New York, not exclusively, but a lot of them are. Uh, they're in positions of power. So there's, a, so there's an unusual amount of tension, attention on Princeton University at this moment, not only because of how powerful its alumni base is and how powerful it is as an institution, uh, but also because of how rapidly the school is expanding. So that often when people talk about Princeton reforming during these years, they talk about it as a progressive reform. So they talk about instituting rules and instituting structures that make it so that it's not just an old boys club. And so, what, but so one of the things that you have uh, from alumni decades later is saying, you know, this wasn't more egalitarian. This wasn't something that provided more structure and order. This was something that created an imperialist environment that was snobbish and aristocratic. So that uh, the rhetoric was that we were making this something that's more egalitarian, but I mean, the, the truth is founded in the fact that it becomes so racially exclusive. So that uh, Princeton did, did have African-American students uh, before Wilson's tenure. And he makes it so that it's not a place where you can do that. So that it, and this is something that people like Du Bois, but obviously other contemporaries are also well aware of. The, the question around the fence and its na and national attention to the fence is fascinating. Most published accounts of the fence are laudatory accounts of the fence. Uh, I have only found one published account that talks about the protests and that talks about the destruction of the fence. The Wall Street Journal is going to put all of this into conversation by 1910 when Princeton, when uh, the alumni board the Board of Trustees is souring against Princeton so that they're going to basically say something to the effect of people are turning against this president. He has, he's accumulating uh, more enemies <laughs> uh, at, at, at the university and that this is in, in a sense like pushing him towards politics. And that's effectively, I think, how historians sort of understand uh, his trajectory as well. Uh, what I did not understand before starting my research on this project is that it was the defense that was the first flashpoint and the tensions that increasingly build between him and the Board of Trustees uh, for the years that follow. Interesting. Um, and we talked, uh, are there other parallels that you see to Wilson and Donald Trump? There, it, it, well, People who know Wilson, people who study Wilson will know more about this, but I didn't realize, I mean, he, Wilson had a very bad temper. He had a very bad temper. And, he, and so uh, his, his sister-in-law said that when, when something didn't go his way, he would sort of barrel into the country like a, a British prime minister. So that uh, Freud, like, Freud wrote about uh, Wilson decades later and all sorts of stuff, all sorts of psychological studies, like trying to understand like what is so strange about this person and why he's so angry and sort of why he is so insistent on having things done his way. That's arguably a parallel. Mm -hmm. um, he had no tolerance whatsoever from any descent from African-Americans. So 
you see that uh, there's someone who's recently written a book around um, Joseph Monroe Trotter uh, and the visit that he pays to the White House in 1914 after um, the government is segregated and, you know, trying to get uh, them to uh, rethink the decision. Um, like Du Bois, Trotter is a Harvard man, he's African American. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to have a segregated government and especially people who are, you know, this elite and, and established and obviously erudite uh, are well aware of this. And he basically kicks Trotter out. Um, I mean, they, they, they have two meetings, but, you know, basically there's a sense of you, if you can't respect me, you don't have any business in the space. I don't, I don't have to sort of engage with you. And so there are some parallels in terms of who the people, who they're willing to do business with, uh, what kind of deference is required. Uh, also sort of, I think a veneer in some circles that's really respected, which I started to take seriously. I mean, what does sort of the, the, uh, the what is sort of the, a platform of purported intellectualism give you? Right, so this idea of I was a professor, therefore I know best, therefore I'm pragmatic. I mean, even Du Bois bought into that for a while. Obviously, uh, Trump has spoken quite a lot about attending the University of Pennsylvania, and obviously people have made fun of his comment about being a very stable genius. You know, but I think there are some parallels, I think, in ways that uh, actually have more in common with the kind of way of being a man uh, than we might think. So something to think about, I guess. Another question came in, is it carrying a metaphor too far to note that collegiate Gothic architecture has rudimentary elements of fortifications, for, exact, for example, e.g. the crenellations? I think it's a really great question. A lot of a lot of scholars, a lot of scholars have uh, done this work and sort of made these in, uh, made these connections. Uh, one that I teach in my history of capitalism class is Michael Dietler, D I E T L E R. He wrote this book, very famous book, Archaeologies Archaeologies of Colonialism. Here it bears remembering that this is not iconography and material culture that. It's just specific to universities. I mean, think about uh, Washington DC, for example. Uh, think about any number of places that sort of carry this kind of imperial opulence. I mean, think about Southern plantations and the ways that those are modeled after Greco-Roman structures. I mean, the, the, the idea and the logic behind these is to support a particular logic of uh, race, race and racial hierarchies, right? If, if, you're, if you're the person who's in a Greco-Roman mansion, and then there's someone who's outside in the slave cabin. I mean, people have talked about this quite a bit uh, in recent years with uh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. It supports and affirms a particular kind of logic so that the built environment is arguably never just the built environment, but it's certainly not just the built environment in this epoch where Princeton is undergoing this dramatic transformation so that the quote that I gave you from Wilson himself gives you a sense that he's very, very aware of what he's doing, that he thinks that he's gaining some advantage by adopting this Greco-Roman Gothic architectural style, right? That it's, you know, gathering more money, it's giving, uh, you know, some kind of authority to like the institution itself. So, I think in some ways we can go too far in terms of, uh, you know, being cynical about it. But I think in this case, I would say that it's worth just reading critically. If he's adding this kind of style to the institution at this particular moment, that he's excluding African Americans, those two things are happening in tandem, mm -hmm. that there's clearly some interconnection between them. It's hard to kind of tease out just what is and what is not a way of understanding it. I think for alum, for a, a set of alumni that graduated from Princeton at that time, they are going to associate this wall with someone who, with the anti-democratic ethos of Wilson. So that by sort of pointing to some of that, uh, pointing it to some of those sources, I'm just reading the sources as they, as, as, as they came. I mean, they came to sort of see this as an example of why we shouldn't 
valorize him as like this like you know sort of amazing uh democratic person <laughs> Uh, and s someone's shared in the chat, actually, it's Michael Dietler, it's at the Archaeologies of Colonialism, and then the Arch Archaeologies of Colonialism, Consumption, uh, Entanglement, and Violence in Ancient Mediterranean France. Um, so, Ber University of Berkeley, University of California Press. So, that is, uh, we've got the reference there, if anyone would like to, re to re do any additional research on that. Oh. Dr. Garibaldi, thank you so much. This was really an amazing talk and I thank you for the slides and the information, the research that you've done on it. I think, as you said, you're gonna take this um, and do a, a paper on it. Yes, I'm working, I'm working on an article. So thank you so much for the, thanks, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the comments and questions. They're all excellent. Um, I've enjoyed this a lot. It is a, a privilege and uh, an honor to have you. And I do want to give a shout out. I said it in the beginning to our uh, summer scholars. We have scholars at the Woodrow Wilson House that come in on each semester. One of the tasks that they had this last summer was to, uh, because we were moving to the Zoom platform, a virtual platform, was to identify, search out and identify uh, professors across America that we would want to hear from and t give topics and conversations talks about uh, conversations that uh, we find at the Wilson House interesting uh, to open the debate, the dialogue, the discourse about Wilson and current events and somehow tie uh, what's happening in today's world to um, and put some context and contextualize what, uh, how we can relate that to the Woodrow Wilson House. So with that, I thank you and I thank our scholars um, for our fall scholars. Uh, this is a great example of what we can do with, um, when, we, when we look out and we see some professors out there in America, this is really a terrific example. So I thank you. Next week, we're going to have a talk. It is going to be uh, with Garrett Peck and Christoph Smimo, a professor. Um, it will be next Tuesday at noon. Uh, at, on Zoom, and I welcome you all to see Garrett Peck and Professor Smimo. So with that, thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.